To start working with the software stack, we usually need to initialize it. In some cases, this happens in two steps. First, we initialize the stack, then we open the TPM device or the communication channel to the TPM. Here in Wolf TPM, we have a single API call to do both at the same time. Also, the Wolf TPM init usually takes care of the start of the TPM. Remember that when we were using the simulator, we had to manually issue the TPM to startup command. The important detail here is the IO callback. The init function takes pointer to a function that implement this callback. And there are several examples how to do this. Linux is supported out of the box, QNX as well, a bare box and so on and so on. This means that we can start using Wolf TPM in a Linux environment straight away. This way, we'll be interacting with the Linux kernel driver for the TPM, and we can just focus on issuing the comments. We'll talk about the template application that we're providing for you to use during the exercises. I just want to assure you that the TPM IO callback is taken care of, so we can really focus on the exercise goal. The typical workflow for generating a primary key is after initializing the OFTPM stack to set authorization for this key. Remember, without authorization, anyone could load that key. Now, here we have several wrappers that we can use. The main one is set out, but the one that I've chosen here is set out password. This already takes care of the operations needed to prepare the authorization slot for password with the proper tag, with the proper flag, and just place our password a string in the right place. So when we run the command for generating the key, when we actually said to the TPM, please generate our primary key, it can process that information and our key gets that password as a requirement. The next step naturally is to select our key type. And the key type, if you remember, we discussed this, is part of the key template. This is where the seed goes. This is where we specify different properties of the key and we'll take a closer look in a moment. And finally, we are ready to use the Wolf TPM wrapper for creating a primary key. Everything that we paired in the previous two steps, the authorization slot, the key template will go into this function. Let's take a closer look. There are three authorization slots for each command. Usually we may have one authorization slot for the primary key, one authorization slot for the child key, and the last one we could use for hmaxation or parametric encryption and so on. Often we would need only one of these authorization slots. And of course, I'm just assuming that we'll always have an hmaxation, so the second one will be by default taken as well. In here, we need to again provide the device context. And you'll notice that most Wolf TPM wrappers require this as the first parameter. This is the way the Wolf TPM handles information about the current TPM device. This means that you actually can be communicating to multiple TPMs on your system, especially if you are in a server environment, you can have multiple virtual TPMs, and each of these TPMs will have its own Wolf TPM to dev structure. Now, if you are unsure of where to place the authorization slot at which number, it's usually to start from a clean state. So start at zero. You have three slots, zero, one, and two. And this is a bit the manual part of using Wolf TPM, but I personally like it because this gives me control over the operations. It is in a way similar to using maybe SAPI, but at the same time, I get all the rich applications of FAPI if I have to compare between the two stacks. So I think it's a nice trade-off. I think it's a nice balance. But again, I come from the industrial space, from the embedded systems. So this is just my preference. In contrast, the SAPI and FAPI API provide almost automatic parameter encryption enabled throughout the whole communication, which is great. Here, we'll have to manually see how to do that with the Wolf TPM stack. And it takes just two API calls, but still it's something that we need to do is not that the stack is taking care of it by itself. And the string operations here are just, for example, how we can set that out value. Now that we have prepared our authorization for the new key that we want to generate, we need to prepare the template that the TPM will use to actually 
generate our key. And there are many options that can go into this. For our ease, we will use the wrapper that just gives us a template for 2048-bit RSA key. And notice this SRK abbreviation. This means storage key. This is a leftover terminology from the days of TPM 1.2 that is now deprecated. Now we're using TPM 2.0. But this terminology remained because it was very familiar to developers. Nowadays, we just use primary keys under the owner hierarchy for our application keys, for our user keys, and so on. Now that we have our key template created, we can move forward with the key generation. There are just two more parameters that are important. We need some kind of key authorization, and the simplest form is to have a password authorization. For this, we need to provide a string and the size of that string, which is then passed to the TPM as a requirement to be embedded into the key. Also, when asking the key to create a primary object, we need to specify under which hierarchy. And as just mentioned, it's usually the owner hierarchy. Other than that, we need to have a variable to hold the result of the operation. Remember, primary key material does not leave the TPM. The private part remains inside the TPM and we're provided only with a handle, an index to where this primary key lives inside the TPM. It was generated and loaded. The public part of this key will be given to us as part of the response of the comment. We are ready to generate our child key now that we have a primary object. This will enable the TPM to wrap our child key once generated so it is in encrypted form outside the TPM. For in contrast with the primary object for the child key, we will receive both the private material and the public material, but the private material will come in an encrypted form. So even if we decide to store it outside our application and the TPM as a file on the disk, it is going to be safe. Only the TPM can load that key. The path is similar to creating a primary key. We need a key template but this time with the proper tags for a child key. And then we need authorization for our new key. It is recommended to have different authorization for the primary key and the child key. Although in some scenarios, you would see that having authorization for the primary key might be enough, given that you have only one child key underneath. So by having the authorization to the primary key, you're the only one who can load the child key. Still, better to have separate authorizations for primary and child keys. Here we have more than two templates. Primary keys are limited to only RSA and ECC. Child keys can be symmetric or key hash as well. We have defaults that are good and we can just start using them. If we need to set more attributes from the TPMA object structure, we can do that. We talked about this in a previous lecture, and also we took a look at the TCG library specification part two that describes the different structures that go into the TPM communication. For example, with the ECC template, we need to specify a curve. We can use the default one or pick one from the common values. Signature scheme is also necessary. We also discussed this in a previous lecture, in some cases, we can even select a new signature scheme, but I would recommend having at least ECDCA or other popular scheme. The symmetric team template requires us to provide a bit more information. Here, we need to set what is the mode of the symmetric operation. And for AES, it could be CFB, CVC, and so on. Uh, also depends on what your TPM actually supports. You can check this with the get cap command that we already learned. Usually the default is ASCFP, but just to be sure, make sure you specify the mode you want. Key bits, naturally we have 128-bit or 92-bit or more AES key. Other than that, we need to define is this going to be used for signing or decryption. This helps the template function, the wrapper, to set the proper flags for our key. Let's talk for a moment about handles. Because when we were using the TPM2 tools, we were using mostly safe TPM context, where in reality, 
the TPM uses numbering scheme to differentiate between the different objects. It also helps us understand is this a transient object that will be lost once the power is turned off, or is this a persistent object that will remain after power off. It also helps us understand when this object lives in the NVRAM or when this is a permanent object that came with the TPM, it is manufactured this way. So the interesting thing is that all handles have the same length, 32 bit, and we can identify the type of the handle by the first eight bits, the most significant. I have put here the four most important handle types. There are a few more, for example, for platform configuration registers, but this will be part of our advanced course. So when you see a handle starting with 8.0 in hex at the beginning, you can be sure that this is a transient object. This is probably a TPM key we created and loaded. And if we don't use the TPM to evict control comet, we will not make this a persistent object. So it will be lost at power cycle. When you use the TPM to evict control command and in our exercises, you probably noticed that the handle, which was in the output, started with 81 in hex. And then we have the NVRAM, which is when we did all of these exercises about using NV indices and NV counter. And there, the index started with 01. We need to know about handles now that we're going to use the API because in certain operations, like when creating a child key, we would need to provide to the TPM the index, the location of the key slot where our primary object is loaded. So the TPM can use that object, generate the child key, and also wrap, encrypt our child key so it comes in a protected form. It is unlikely that you have to remember all these numbers, but during debugging or testing, you would see an index coming out of the TPM or coming out of your program, and it's just easier to know the beginning of the indexes. So you know, oh, this is the primary key, or this is my evict control command failing, or this is an object in NVRAM or something else. So although these indexes are needed, we will usually assign them to a variable in the previous call and then use them in the next API call immediately or something like that. So the indexes will not be something we really operate on, like we'll not be increasing or decreasing the indexes. It is what the TPM will provide for us. The TPM is the only entity that can actually generate this unless we want to specify, for example, I want this NV index at offset or at this number, but it has to be in that range. The TPM will be the one that will confirm this request. And here is the create key wrapper. You immediately notice that the structure that holds the child key is different from the structure that we used for the, for the primary key. The reason is that we receive the private material for the child key. Of course, it comes in a protected form, but this requires a different structure. Now that we have our public template and we also have prepared a separate authorization, we can just use that wrapper to ask the TPM to create the new key. And remember, in this case, we no longer have to specify the hierarchy as a parent, but we need to specify the primary key handle that we created. When trying to solve the exercises in this part of the course, please use our template because it gives you a quick start into building a simple Wolf TPM application. This contains two main parts. One is the actual application talking to the TPM and the other is the TPM IO callback that we took from the example callback for Linux. Because our Docker environment runs in Linux, this works very well. The changes are expected to happen only in the main application. You should not have to do anything with the TPM IO callback. This means that the Wolf TPM init call should work as is. We also provide a make file to make it easier to immediately build the application. So once you have changes, just make sure to rebuild, use make clean, whatever you, you decide. In case you face problems, it's good to check the TPM log that the TPM simulator creates. Sometimes there is important information in there and we can have more verbose output for the simulator. What I have found in my practice is that having more verbose information from the stack is very helpful as well. For this, you would have to rebuild the Wolf TPM library and install it again. There is a nice option enable debug, 
and it has even levels of debugging where verbose is the highest. I think having that just in mind in case the TPM simulator output is not enough is good. And then you can always reach out to us in the OST2 forum.